Congratulations. You have reached the Corona DSO 592 Exchange. Thank you. the MPAA, the ACE, and Johnny Gormley here in Saskatchewan. And today I have a special guest out in uh, the eastern seaboard somewhere in the United States. Uh, Shovel, are you still there? I'm here to still be here. Good to hear. And so Shovel is someone who used to have offs a lot, my recollection back in the radio IRC days. But for people who were not on IRC in the Rant Radio days, how would you describe yourself to the world to maybe give some idea of where you're kind of coming from, Shovel? Man, I'm uh, a dreaming ape. I uh, evolved a whole bunch of people prior to me did a lot of humping, and somehow I showed up and forced to reckon with the fact that I'm self-aware and I probably will die at some point. And, you know, sometime in between the beginning part and end part, I have to actually do a whole bunch of shit. I don't really want to. Does that satisfy you? That, that sounds about right. <laughs> Beautiful little imagery there. In particular, on the on the dreaming side, I know before we get too much into the politics, I just kind of wanted to start... Politics now? What's that? We gotta talk politics now? <laughs> yeah, we'll eventually get to politics. Uh, for Let sure. me bring my laptop into the uh, bathroom. That'll probably make things a little easier. <laughs> we will definitely sample the hell out of that. But the uh, I notice you tend not to post all that much on Facebook, which kudos, by the way, keeping off of social media, at least as far as I can tell. But one of the things you've pointed out to the world is this hope for the future in the topic of water and the ability for humankind to at least solve one of the major problems that is facing us. And I just wanted to get a little bit of an impression from you of your thoughts of where, what this bio desal thing is and what is your dream on that and what kind of dreams oh. does that enable? Yeah, I recently posted a thing about a halophytic crops, which is crops that eat salt water, basically. And no hyperbole, this is as serious as a human being can be. This is the most important thing human beings can be doing right now to ensure our future survival. Full stop. I can't say that more seriously than that. There's no fucking overstating this. This is the most important thing we can be doing. Okay, so for our listeners, what is biodiesel and what is this halophytic algae? Where does it come from? What can we know about it from your perspective? Well, so background on this is probably going to have to go a little bit circuitous in that. In the state of Arizona, for example, there's the Colorado River that makes the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon is a enormous hole in the earth that has this enormous river traveling through it. And by way of that canyon, which originates in the state of Colorado and then travels like 2,000 miles, which is like 3,500 kilometers or something like that, we take that entire river and we package it and we ship it to Saudi Arabia. We ship the river to Saudi Arabia okay. right now. And you might be scratching your head about that. I'm not joking. Because water is pretty heavy, river, right? Like, it's Arabia. not like it's a cheap thing to transport. Never mind large quantities of it. Right. <laughs> 
So the way this works is around the town of Blythe, California, which is on the border between California and Arizona in the southwest U.S., there's a way that the law has been kind of jerked around. The Colorado River has a lot of different people and, and states that have rights to it legally on paper. They have the right to the water resource okay. there. And the river, under natural circumstances, would just flow to Mexico and go to the Sea of Cortez. That's its historic thing. It doesn't flow into Mexico anymore. It completely just doesn't get to Mexico at all. Because all these different places get it, right? It gets it goes to Phoenix, it goes to Tucson for people to drink and wash their butts and water their lawns. It goes to Las Vegas to take care of all Vegas's stuff. Okay. But part of it that they take and they ship to Saudi Arabia, around Blythe, the city of Blythe at some point in ancient history managed to negotiate that they have full rights to the river. They don't have to worry about who's downstream of that. They can right. just take as much river as gets to them and if they just stop it right there good for them they don't have to worry about the fact that it still is supposed to continue on and help other people right so a whole lot of saudi and in Dubai, interests have purchased farms around there, and they farm hay, and then they ship that hay to the arid desert-ass place that they live, so that they can grow livestock and have meat and cheese and that kind of stuff. And that so, does count as shipping water. Like, it, and I'm not understating this, too. Like, one of the things that we learned in the various, uh, for example, ecological economics course that I took in university is, like, how you can actually look at the amount of water content that goes into something like, for example, hay. You can measure the amount of water that goes into producing that hay and then look at the imports and exports of different countries, regions, cities, whatever, and they see, well, okay, water comes in, water goes out, right? And in this case, the water is coming in from the river. It's going out in the form of hay, eventually finding its way to Saudi Arabia, Dubai, whatever. But it really is important to like track the water, not just the visible physical water, but also embedded in things like hay, in products, not just like bottled water, but things that take water to produce that you could not produce yes. otherwise without and actual the thing water. With, you know, those nations is that that's a way that, that's more economical for them than desalinating water. Right. Because they're surrounded by ocean, right? They've got seas there, but it's cheaper to grow hay in the United States, pay their taxes in the United States, export it and ship it halfway around the world, burning hydrocarbon-rich fuels in ships to bring it over there. That's cheaper than desalinating their water locally. Right. Yeah. And, okay, so everyone listening to this, I don't know how, many, how big your footprint is, but I'm going to pretend and assume and expect that everyone listening is smart enough that their brain has a way where you can take the information I just shared with you and store it off in a corner and we'll talk about a different subject that's related to this. Okay. We're all good? Go for it. So right now we're taking the Colorado River and we're packaging it up as hay and we're shipping it to Dubai because they don't have water there. And that's just one little sliver. That Of course, they're not a unique circumstance. That's something that's happening worldwide where people are shipping water around where they need water because it's too expensive to desalinate the ocean, which covers like 70% of our planet. Right. Next thing is that climate change is occurring because we're taking carbon out of the ground and sticking it in the air. Everyone knows the science of this or they're in denial and they're an idiot and they just kill yourself. <laughs> Everyone else understands the mechanics of this we're taking carbon that's been sequestered over millions and millions of years out of the ground and we're putting it up in the air over hundreds of years and nature has a hard time with that kind of change and that's just what we're seeing that's reality and that sucks and it sucks for things that have gotten used to the way that things have been for tens of thousands of years like us and all the things we like like animals and plants right and it's not that we're burning that fuel in cars that's not really the big deal people like to blame internal combustion engines and think that those are evil but really that doesn't matter it's completely inconsequential the fact is that we're taking carbon from the ground and putting it in the air. Right. And then carbon from the air is absorbing down into the ocean because that's how that works. When you have two different mediums that can both absorb something, they'll reach an equilibrium. So if there's more carbon in the air than there is in the water, it'll get through the water, through the surface, and into the water. And that makes the ocean more acidic, which damages the shells of shellfish. And this is all stuff that's like not really a revelation. Everyone knows this if they've been paying any attention at all. But the point is, it's not internal combustion that's the enemy here. The point is that... It, we're taking carbon out of the ground and putting it in the air. Right. Can't get any simpler than that. So if we could take all the things that we're doing right now with ground-based carbon and use not ground-based carbon but still do that, we would effectively subvert all of that problem. So every car that exists on Earth, every ship that right now exists on Earth, every semi-truck, everything on Earth could be converted directly to being solar-powered if we could have a solar-powered source of carbon. Right. That makes sense? So far, so good. So what we can do with a halophytic crop, a halophytic crop is a crop of vegetable matter that likes to grow on salt water. That's really all that means. Okay. And if you have an algae or a seaweed or any other kind of vegetation that's able to grow in seawater, it does two things. 
First, it takes carbon out of the water in which it grows. So you're deacidifying the ocean. You're reversing the ocean acidification that we're right now getting. And there's a significant source of carbon to take out at this point. It's not even just that there's like no carbon whatsoever in the ocean. We know that we're putting carbon in the ocean. We've been putting it there. Yeah, we yeah. measure that. Exactly. So, so it's there. It's available to use. We have carbon enriched it. Yes, we've done this. And the kind of nice thing with this is that, and I, we could probably get on a tangent there and get too confusing, but there's no risk of going too far on this. There's no risk of overshooting the mark and then taking too much carbon out of it. That's not how this works. We've right. got too much. The rest of it will sequester itself over time if we just give it a chance. And all we need to do is maintain an equilibrium instead of contributing more to the problem. Right. So the other side effect of these helophytic crops is that if you're running a flow through them, right, if you're taking seawater into them and then you're growing these helophytic crops, the effluent that comes out of that easily converts to a desalinated or partially desalinated water source. It, so there's, a, there's an important point here, which is that a lot of the cost is in getting from pure salt water to mostly or somewhat desal water like going from pure salt water to water. brackish water, right? And so if you can just decrease the cost of that step, that is enough to have serious economic consequences. But go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it does become more affordable. And just like anything else, like right now, it's kind of in its infancy. People have been putting quite a bit into it. This isn't like some fringe whack job shit. Like Exxon has invested $26 million into this. Right. So it's, and they have been for like 13, 14 years now, putting a significant amount into this because they recognize that eventually fossil fuels will be legislated out, thankfully. And, they'll need to still be able to supply fuel. Now, the nice thing with this is, is you've got a single crop that can produce for you desalinated water and also motor fuel, and it uses polluted seawater and sunlight to, to do this magic trick. And it doesn't require you to use arable land, so whenever pe people complain about the difference between like using the corn crops for fuel versus food, well, you're not using land that could be used to grow food. You're using the ocean, which can't be really used to grow a whole lot of anything, and you're making it healthier so that the other parts that you want to fish will be healthier and will produce more fish too. Right. So another thing that came out this week, so at least yeah. in terms of the fuel, one of the things this week in the news right now is the Fukushima reactor in Japan has recently announced that they've got all this water that they've been storing for years and years and years that is somewhat hot. I don't know exactly how hot. I don't even know if they know exactly how hot, but it's a little hot and they've been keeping it from going into the ocean, storing it and storing it and storing it. And they finally announced they're going to start releasing it into the ocean, even though they know that it's still above their recommended level for clean water going back into the ocean. Now, in this case, though, assuming that it's not too hot to kill this these crops, right, and that we could have a region of the sea around Fukushima with these crops growing, assuming we didn't eat the, <laughs> the the output of these crops, would that be a problem even I in this case? Be a good, that wouldn't be a good pairing because if you're sitting there going, okay, we have, you know, these radio radioactive isotopes of carbon now that we're going to be emitting into the air. All that's going to do is stir it around the earth faster, and that's probably not the right way to go about it. Okay. I don't really know the solution to what they should do with the water from Fukushima, but I wouldn't advise turning it into motor fuel. Okay, um, okay, that, that, that's fair. <laughs> so to kind of wrap up the thing on the halophytic crops, this all sounds like fantasy land shit, and in a way it kind of is because it's not right now economically possible to make a profit doing it. That's the key part right here. It's not profitable at the scale they can do yeah, it. Yeah, I was going to say, it's, it's not good. profitable at the oh, scale, and the scale is an important important part, right? Because it the scale is has possible. to be absolutely huge. Yeah. The scale has to be ginormous because the idea here is we want to replace gasoline and diesel and bunker fuel. Right. We want to replace these entirely. And if we can, we want to replace natural gas entirely. And so the scale is enormous, but achievable. It's not like we need an entire second planet full of ocean and we're going to do this. It's, we can do it with the shorelines we have, but it's not anywhere close to economically viable currently. And that's the part we have to get over is, does something that saves all of our lives have to make money? So, yeah, and that, you know, so th this brings us back to the dreaded politics question here, because in both of our countries right now, we have another easier to solve problem going on in terms of COVID, where we know how to address it. We have a pretty good idea of what it would take, how much financial resources is going to be necessary to keep people from starving to death, et cetera, et cetera. And yet, on the national level, at the local level, we seem to be having trouble with this easier problem. And so it's like, what can we do to get one step closer to being able to think on this level, right? So here's the thing that I find to be the core of all of it is, and that goes for like every problem ever. This might be like the most simplified, like how do you find the root cause of all this bullshit? When I was a child, and when you were a child probably, and most of us were children, we were taught, and I go back to this example kind of a lot, even though probably to you and to maybe other people listen might not have heard 
heard this before, but my wife would be like, oh my God, shut the fuck up. When I was a child and we were child, we were taught that the Bernoulli principle or the equal transit principle was responsible for winged flight, right? Airplanes flew through the air because you have this airfoil shaped thing and air takes a longer time to go across the top versus the bottom of it, and that produces suction and you get your lift. That's not how flight works. But we were all taught that when we were children. When we were kids, yeah, we were all taught that. We were definitely school, taught that in ground school uh, to like learn how to fly, which is a little troubling in retrospect. But yeah, it's not actually fully accurate. Yeah, well, it's not at all accurate. That's not at all how flight works. Flight works the same way that a ceiling fan works. You have something at an angle, air hits it and goes that way. And that's actually how flight works. The reason you have the airfoil shape is it reduces forward drag while you're doing that. Right. That's the only reason it exists. This has been so you're sitting there going like really this is a fact this has already been proven conclusively by NASA like 12 13 years ago they went through every analysis in the universe on this and so the airflow shape has nothing to do with lift it just reduces drag while your regular just a fan operating is what produces lift and the reason I bring this up is it may not sound like it has anything to do with the economics question you asked but it does when I got new information when I saw NASA's thorough study on this I go oh okay there was old information that was wrong I was taught when I was a child of this wrong shit and then a lot of much smarter people with a lot better hardware figured out new shit that replaces that old shit cool i'll just go along with the new stuff and similarly like when i was a child pluto was a planet and then at some point a bunch of scientists were like hey if we classify this rock as a planet then we also have to classify all these other similar rocks as planets and that makes a mess of the whole fucking thing so let's change the classification of this particular rock to not a planet anymore, and then we can have a much clearer understanding of our universe. Cool. I didn't need to go ahead and get butthurt about that and go, oh no, Pluto's a planet, it has to be a planet. I go, okay, cool, we've updated this information with new information for a good reason, and let's move forward. Right. And that mindset, the mindset of going, oh, we have new information, cool, I can just update my info in my head, I didn't chisel it into stone up there, and now we can move forward with this new updated information. And even and the, the chiseling into stone is actually kind of an important point there, because like, we have the ability to write, and we've had the ability to write for quite some time, and being able to write allows us to have a stable thing outside of ourselves, where we can point to and go, okay, what is, how many planets do we have in our solar system? system. Well, here's the list, the record, the, the record chiseled into the stone, written on the bone, written on the papyrus, written on paper, eventually put on a computer. And now we have these computer networks that allow us to do this at a much, much more rapid rate. We've got the ability to coordinate at this high level. And yet, what are we using all this power for, what this technology for, right? And so as far as improving our picture of the world, we do have, the, the Pluto example is a good one because it's, the other rocks are still there. It's not like we haven't got the other objects to keep track of, but we have NASA, for example, is probably people or computer systems dedicated specifically to tracking the smaller objects so most normal people don't have to. It's like there's a level of complexity we know we can handle. And keeping that in mind while still describing the important things about what we want to talk about is important in and of itself. So Yeah, we just have to be willing to update the things that we thought we took for granted, the things we thought we knew. Yeah, it doesn't mean like just follow any new thing. It's vet it. I mean, properly understand it and go, okay, there's a reason why we're changing our minds here. There's a reason why we're changing what we know. And that mindset of being able to uh, update your knowledge and update your understanding and, and be a little bit fluid, be a little plastic with your understanding of everything, makes it a a lot easier to work with changes because like the whole world is always going to change that's like the only certain thing in the world is change right and that it's literally the definition of time passing is change so you have to be ready to kind of roll with it and having that mindset where you have to tell yourself hey i can just adapt if there's a new thing i can just adapt it means that you don't waste your energy spinning your wheels going well i'm not going to wear a mask because that's a, a tyrant telling you that i have to wear a mask and i don't want a dictator telling you to wear a mask or whatever no dude like it's just to save lives chill the fuck out you don't have to fight over that and in terms of like changing our taxation structures or changing how we do health care or changing how we feel our vehicles or how we get fresh water or anything like that if it's a new thing and it's a good idea don't let politics get in the way of a good idea just go okay hey, yeah that actually makes sense let's go ahead and do that i'm strong and i can make a change right you know, it's really not something that people need to get hurt in the butt about and like there's a couple of things that do help with that which is one is viewing things in terms of probability rather than certainty so for example things like the, the pluto's a planet example right where like we can define planet to allow us to express things in a simple way that the other plan planetary objects don't bother us. But like, if we encounter some new thing in our field of vision, 
maybe we, when we get the James Webb telescope up, we start looking around our own solar system, we find something else, right? We can actually start thinking of things in terms of, well, how big is it, right? And how well do we know how big this object is? And not hiding the fact that we're to not completely certain about everything in our life. Like, for example, within my lifetime, there has been a bone discovered in the human body that was not known to medicine prior to our lifetime. You would think that there are a lot of things that are certain that really are, there is still that little bound of uncertainty around. And so we can still learn things. We can still, like, advance the state of the art. It is still possible. Things like, for example, masks, right? Like, there are still studies ongoing today. We could learn something completely new. I, I was reading uh, yesterday about uh, apparently silk masks are fairly good, better than cloth masks, perhaps. And that's just like one example of like, as long as we're careful with our uncertainty and careful with like the probabilities involved, like there's room for being willing to accept change, right? There's, of course, the difficulty that disinformation and the politicization of all that has made it hard to expend a lot of energy. And I tried to recall who it was. There was a, it was like, I think Denzel Washington was famous for saying, that if you watch the news, you're misinformed. And if you don't watch the news, you're uninformed. Right. And someone asked him like, okay, so what do you do? And he's like, that's a pretty good question. <laughs> and so when it comes to all these topics, you have to spend a lot of energy reading and paying attention to a lot of bullshit, recognizing that most of it is bullshit. And then, you know, figure, okay, what are the likelihoods that all these liars have the same story straight? Right. And, if they don't, if they haven't coordinated their stories in advance and they're just blathering out garbage, somehow the truth kind of becomes granular in there. You, you kind of start seeing, you know, it's a bit like seeing an object in a sandstorm. You know, the sandstorm's staying in your eyes and it sucks, but eventually you do see the object that's there. Right. You know, and, and I think that's how the truth has to come out in, in terms of the current climate. And that's something that, again, has an easy solution, but no one wants to take it. The easy solution is that I can't sell you a tub full of boogers and call it butter. I can't put a, a tub full of my boogers with the word butter on it and stick it on the shelf at the grocery store. That's not free speech. Right. The, the law doesn't recognize that as protected free speech. And for the same reason, we need to have that apply to the word news. You can't package a bunch of bullshit with the word news written on it, stick it on a shelf and try to sell it for the same reason. And it, it's easy. We already have the law. We don't need to make a new law. We just need to enforce it on products like news. Right. And, and, then and all we also, like, we, we do have similar laws don't here. Have Tucker Carlson anymore. You know, that yeah. goes away. And, or BuzzFeed, for that matter. Yeah. Right? Like, BuzzFeed has made, and Gawker before it, has practically made a business out of publishing news as quickly quickly as possible, having the most raw story possible without any regard for whether it's true, right? And, yeah, and that's being leveraged by people who gain from creating chaos. And there are some people who thrive in chaos because it means they can say anything they want and it just kind of falls into the canyon of bullshit. And since we already have a law against marketing the wrong product, we already have a law against putting poison in a jar and selling it as milk, it's already illegal. We don't need to make a new law for this. We just need to enforce the law we already have. What do you fucking do? And I know people don't like easy solutions, but that's a really fucking easy solution. Like a really, really easy solution. Just do it. Stop saying why not to. Just fucking do it. Right. Now, on that side, though, like I know over the years, one of the things this information technology revolution is brought to us is that the boundaries around professions like, for example, journalism and news, the ability, say, 75 years ago to start up your own competitor to, say, the New York Times or some major newspaper was fairly hot. Like, you had to get investors, you had to get a printing press, you had to do all this physical labor in order to do it, whereas now, an Apache web server and knowing the right person to link to you to actually get some eyeballs, both of those things really cost nothing to the people who are already connected enough to have access to them. Well, yeah, it's there's just, a yeah. lot of people who are taking advantage of platforms like TikTok, mm -hmm. where you can get, like, 20 million people to see your statement, whatever your statement is. And there's things that have always helped. If you're a good-looking young woman, that gets a lot of eyeballs just by its own nature. We're human beings and we're hardwired to look at that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so if you're a comfortable and sharp young woman who happens to have that conventional good looks going on with you, but also has a mind to say something politically, a lot of girls are doing that now. And that's cool because it's a way of they can leverage a platform and leverage something that's already going to happen anyways. People are going to look at them anyways. If people look at them and think with more than just their dick for a second, that's an extra good thing. So I think that's kind of a cool thing that we have the democratization of celebrity 
liberty and the democratization of information sharing. You know, it's not as easy for you know, someone who doesn't have much going on. Like if you're not regularly doing something that people find interesting and you can't make a, a huge following of people by putting up regular publications to your Instagram or your TikTok or your YouTube or whatever, there, there's still a pretty big barrier to entry. But for people who are doing that anyways, just as a hobby, well, now you got a platform. Now you can subversively shove things in there. Even if you, your platform has nothing to do with politics, you can kind of favor what you're showing and what you're not showing. You know? But back on the topic of the existing fake news laws that we have, which we do, both of our countries, we have those. But for those people, for the equivalent of the well, next really, Greta you know, Thunberg, right, but, for example, like the next good looking woman to come up with her 20 seconds of fame and to promote her idea, if that idea is fake, should there be some kind of a legal consequence? Is that the right tool for the job? Or is there something no, like I, we haven't the found way to yet? Do this is if you are a business entity, if you pay taxes as a business, I think you should just be forced to label if you're, if you're peddling entertainment or if you're peddling news. Like, just have that on the screen. Like, we as a country act like we can't do things. People tie their hands and go, oh, I can't, I can't do that. Well, we shut down every business in the country overnight. Yeah. Like, we just shut down every bar in the country overnight. We just shut them down. And we shut down every restaurant overnight. We shut down everything else overnight. So if people say, oh, we can't force news agencies to put a little overlay that says this is factual news or this is an entertainment piece. Yeah, we can. Just say that you have to do it. It's law. And you're in business. And if you don't follow the law, you're out of business. Next. It's kind of like, like it's uh, not hard. This isn't something that requires us to invent any new technology. I went to the local supermarket here in Saskatoon a Superstore, which has just been described as like just this big supermarket with lots of things, not like a high-end one or anything like that. But I found it was interesting. They had a big sign walking into this building. You could not miss this sign saying, masks are mandatory in this facility. Like, you have to wear a mask to come. And I don't remember the exact words, but like it was pretty obvious what the sign actually said. I had my mask. I'm not going to like claim here that I know enough about the science. I'll take your word for it that in this particular case, it is a good idea. But regardless, like they have the policy. It is a store policy. You can't enter the building unless you have a mask. And yet half to a third of the patrons of this supermarket were not wearing masks. And so I go to the customer service and I ask them about it. I'm like, okay, so like, are you going to do anything about this? Like, where is your security? Right. And they're like, oh, well, we can't enforce the company policy because it's not a bylaw. And it's like, that makes no sense at all. Um, yeah, you can. You could just say, hey, fuck out. Yeah, like, if I were to take my pants off in the middle of the store and start urinating over all the fruit, like, they would drag my ass out of the store. Like, yeah. there's no question about it. That If you cause problems and do disgusting things in the store, security is there. They will drag you out. And prior to this, you know, like, years ago, my wife worked at a grocery store, and they had a lot of people stealing, because that's what people do. People just, and I don't want to get into, like, the motivations behind it, but the fact is, people People do a lot of just helping themselves to things, and that raises the prices for everyone else, you know. Right. And you know, the store has to make money at the end of the day. They have to have a positive income, so they can't just, as a charity, let people take stuff. So they have to raise the price on everything for the rest of them. And I said, like, why don't you just have big ass big screens on the front wall of the, of the store? So people standing there in the checkout, they see this big screen, and just all the people that you see on video of shoplifting, just play them back all the time with their faces, like zoom in on their faces, be like, this person is charging, you know, costing you more money. Like, they it's like these straw. Exactly. These strawberries cost like 35 more cents because this son of a bitch, right? <laughs> exactly. Like they could just have like, you know, here's this broccoli that costs like $1.79. Well, it would only be $1.29 if it wasn't for this fucker right here. And my wife was like, you know, she's not quite the hard ass I am, but she was like, oh, we can't do that. I'm like, why not? Name one reason you can't do that. They're stealing from you. Fuck them. You don't have to be polite to them. You don't have to go like, oh, well, you know, poor people stealing. Like I get that there's a lot of economic hardship and people are homeless and hungry. And I, like I'm not being disappointed compassionate about that but nonetheless they're stealing from that store and the store can put up a big TV with a picture of those people and shame them and if you are shopping there and you see your son or your daughter is up there shop stealing you could go home and say what the fuck are you doing stealing from the store you're making my groceries more expensive you right. know like but, shame people and, and like there's also a difference there too between what the store can do legally and then what the store should do and then like the implications of that on their customers slash the community around them right like there's three different things and in this case like if they can't legally do this, it might be worth asking why, right? Like if, if there's some, maybe if it's a privacy thing, right? then that would be the sort of thing where we could go back to the elected officials and say, you know, this particular exception might be justified. Right? And we could go into the questions of, like, the, well, there are young about, mothers like, stealing... Cover their face with something, like, I don't know, a fucking mask. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Problem solved. Like, these problems don't have hard solutions. Yeah. <laughs> 
And, uh, I think that's a big thing. Like people, people act like they can't take action, and it's like no action can be taken. Like it's not slanderous to show a shoplifter on a big screen. If you have video evidence of them shoplifting, that's not slander. That's there's the video of them doing it. It's not you're you're not libelously making shit up about them. And and you could even do stuff like, for example, I mean, we've got the facial recognition technology. It's probably already in use in the store. Like, why not just let them get away with it once and let them have a warning before putting their face on the screen? Or like, like you know, that sort of thing, right? Making it proportional to the actual act that they've done, right? And if they get caught and they're a single mother stealing milk or meat or something for their kids, connect them with social services so that their help is available. So if that's the problem, that these kinds of proportional responses are possible. And like you say, we, they're doable. You can do them, right? Yeah. There's a ton of stuff where like we can't just throw money at scientists and say, hey, scientists, I want teleportation next year. Yeah. Here's a pile of money. Give me teleportation. Because we don't even have a theory for that. Like we don't even know like how to do that. So those are like, I want teleportation. I want faster than light travel. I want whatever. Like those are fantasy land things that maybe at some point we might crack the code. But, but then there's like other stuff where it's like, no, this is on the shelf. Like, we, we could do this right now. The only thing stopping us is you deciding not to with your butt. Show yeah. your butts up your butts. Like, we could do this. And actually, on the topic of the science thing, too, like, we know maybe teleportation specifically, maybe that's impossible. Maybe we're never, no matter how much science and technology, like, the entire history of the universe is never going to happen. But if it is possible. And if similarly miraculous things, which you could go back like 10,000 years and go, okay, what's possible? And then like compare and contrast to what we're doing today, speaking to each other through a glass screen from a thousand kilometers away, right? I mean, we know yeah, this, that- this is just an extensive extension of like existing principles. This is like, I don't really think that telecommunications is as big of a leap as like actual teleportation or actual faster than light travel. We don't even have this stepping stones to that stuff yet. Right. But that's the kind of problem where just throwing money at it doesn't solve it, whereas we have a ton of problems that we could just decide to do. It's on the shelf. We don't have to invent anything to do this. We just can do it. But like, even the seemingly impossible things, right? If you're actually interested in that happening, we know that the ways to do it are like not having a culture where you're afraid to publish your results. Not having a culture where there's, for example, a strong man in power who can defund an entire government domain on the scale of, like, for example, the WHO, like, on the whims of his personal beliefs, right? Like, there are little tiny things that we know can break the process of science and can slow it dramatically. But, I mean, there's no guarantee that we'll get teleportation if we don't do these things. We just know that, like, you can shoot yourself in the foot, right? Can we not do that? I don't know, but... Can we not do that? Well, it's kind of part of the thing with you can unlearn things that you learned before if they were wrong or if the data changes. And one that really poisons the shit out of society right now is the misunderstanding of how money works. And this one, whoever's listening to this might disagree with me, but they're wrong. I'm just going to say <laughs> that fucking wrong. Money circulates. Money is in circulation. We actually call it that. It is not a consumable resource. If you have a pile of firewood, that is a consumable resource. You take the piece of wood out of the, the pile, you put it in the fireplace, it goes away, and now you have less, right? right? That's how a consumable resource works. That's not how money works. Money works like blood. Money works where you have the cells, you have the dollars, and they go that way, and then they come back around, and then they go that way again, and then they come back around. And if you want to get more work out of the system, you make them go faster. Right. That's it. That's it. That's how money works. And I'm the only person talking about this. I mean, maybe not I'm the only person, but I feel like I'm the only person talking about this. Money is a circulatory resource, and if we would all just consumable resource, because it never has been. It has never been a consumable resource. And if we could all just stop imagining it with that metaphor and start replacing that stupid, broken, never right metaphor with the always correct metaphor of it's a circulatory resource like blood, we will change every decision we make and we will become stronger just simply by not being wrong anymore. Right. And that's one of the things that the Ripple slash Villages project like really tries to drive home. And I think that as a project, we've kind of failed to get that message across because you're you're absolutely correct. Like money, especially if it's worth anything, I think there's there's a key distinction there. Like we can stop the flow of money. It is logically possible that I mean maybe not on the scale of something like the United States, although given what else has stopped during COVID, maybe, I don't know. But like you can stop large quantities of money from moving. You can put the brakes on and hard stop 
a lot of the circulation, but it's kind of like in the, the same kind of metaphor, like a heart attack, right? Like when blood stops circulating, you're not getting oxygen to the different parts of the body. Things go bad very quickly. If money yeah. stops moving, we have problems very quickly. Uh, one or of the you get one organ that just starts hogging all of the blood cells and they all just pile up in one organ that usually kills the patient. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And one of the previous episodes, uh, Romulus was on, and he made the point that like, a recession is a situation where like, people stop spending money. And it was framed in terms of like this, we need to think of a way to, to conceive of our economic system so that it is sustainable. And it isn't just like where if people stop spending money on bullshit things, w that the whole thing s fails. But your your point is also like very important that like we, at the, at the same time, we may not need to spend money on the things that don't matter. We do still need to keep the money moving so that the whole of the machine can keep working, at least the important parts, the vital organs, etc., etc. Well, this is something that we already do all the time. Like, there's half the trucks on the road are empty, like the freight trucks, half of them are empty because they got to go back to what fills them the fuck up. Right. Like, so your truck leaves the quarry full of rocks or whatever, and then it goes back to the quarry empty because you can't just send full trucks out. You got to send empty trucks back. That's how it works. And the same way we've got like half the airplanes flying around are empty because okay, maybe not a lot of people want to go from Salt Lake City to Los Angeles, but a lot of people want to go from Los Angeles to Seattle. Right. So you get that plane, it has to still make that flight, whether or not there's passengers on it, because you still have to get it where it needs to be. And so, like, if your money has to go somewhere without necessarily producing a product as a result of it, like if you have to take money and move it from one location to another without someone doing some work in between, that's just your empty truck. That's your empty airplane. That's your way of getting past a roadblock in that flow so that the flow can continue. Because otherwise, like if you've ever played an RPG and you've got like a bunch of people all like sitting around and then one of them has to go take a shit. And so they get up and they leave and they go take a shit. Everyone has to stop playing while they're shitting or skip their turn and everyone gets to keep playing. Right. Like, we already understand this. We already know how this works. The only difference is that we keep failing to put that on money, even though that's exactly what money is. We just keep, for some reason, using this stupid, never been correct consumable resource metaphor on it. And so how do you solve that? Well, learn to update your fucking shit. You, know, you don't have a head full of chiseled rock text. You have meat that you can update on a regular basis, and you probably should. And updating that gray matter might matter. So we are getting near the end of the show here. So do you have any last words now that you have the world's attention? Maybe some way that we should be updating our gray matter here listening to your voice um i have i actually didn't even know how long your podcast thing was okay no man i mean like just i got nothing else to add the whole mask thing is something important to worry about so it doesn't have to be political it's not no there's no tyrant dictator person just play along just, it's what we're doing like i feel like with half the people not wearing masks that when you're wearing a mask it's a little bit like bailing out the half back half of the, the titanic like <laughs> it's kind of masturbation because if everyone else is already spreading the disease anyways is your mask really going to do any good right. i get that but just play along it's just going to be over sooner if we all just kind of play along it's, it doesn't have to be a political opinion it's just do the thing and everyone else is everyone should also be so I mean, that's kind of the only thing i, I got to really add from what we've been talking about so far all right well so thank you again michelle for participating this week and just as a reminder for those of you out there that there is a subscribestar.com slash jeff dash cliff that you can help maintain and sustain this show keep those dollars moving at least in at least the directions that I would like to have them move to. And I will end this week with the goodbye song, and I will see you all next week.